this while we have been focusing upon the brilliant military careers of different great Gupta rulers. We learned how different Gupta rulers like Chandragupta I, Samudra Gupta or Vikramaditya managed to annex different territories in different parts of the Indian subcontinent to make the Gupta empire even larger in dimension. But when we talk about different developments and changes that happened in the Indian subcontinent during the Gupta period, be that on the religious front, on the technological front, on the scientific front, on the front of arts and literature, we need to take into account the various policies that were implemented by the different Gupta rulers. Now, Without proper administration of a huge and vast empire, it will inevitably fall into pieces. Now allow me to give you an example so that you can understand this better. Suppose you are today the principal of your school and you have to take into account the various kinds of things that are happening in your school, be that the teaching learning process or other extracurricular activities. Now, if you do not implement certain rules and regulations, these various activities cannot happen smoothly. These rules and regulations come under the bigger umbrella of what we know as administration. And in this lesson, we will be focusing upon the Gupta administration. And when we introduce ourselves to the Gupta administration, we will get to know how different Gupta rulers were very successful in managing such a huge empire. So let us now begin this discussion on Gupta administration. Now the Gupta period has been rightly termed as the golden age of Indian history. In different fields, manifold changes and developments were taking place. Now many of these changes and developments were further facilitated by the Gupta administration. Now when we talk about the Gupta administration, a very prominent feature of this Gupta administration would be that it was decentralized in nature. But what does decentralized mean? Unlike other empires and kingdoms that were ruling in several pockets of the Indian subcontinent, the Gupta empire was decentralized. Now you have to first understand what is centralized nature of power. When power is centralized, it means that it rests at the disposal of the head of the state, be that the ruler, the monarch, the emperor or the king. But what we witness when we come to the Gupta administration is that the power was not centralized, it was decentralized. So it was not just the Gupta ruler who had all the power in his hands. This power was further divided among various people. But how did this administration perform when the power was not centralized in the hand of the ruler alone? And when the power was divided and diffused among various officers? Let us now find out in detail what this decentralized nature of the Gupta administration was. Now, the king was helped by a council of ministers known as the Amatyas. So, at the top of the state was the king and then were the Amatyas or the council of ministers. Now, the Gupta king was also helped and assisted by the Mahadandanayaka who was the chief justice or chief judicial officer. So can you understand how this was in ways more than one so modern in spirit and nature? Because even in today's democratic India, we see that the prime minister of the country is assisted by a council of ministers. Likewise, the Gupta ruler was also assisted by the Amatyas. And in order to preserve the justice and judicial apparatus in the state, the Mahadandanayaka 
assisted the Gupta ruler. For the purpose of better administration, the entire Gupta kingdom was divided into separate provinces which were known as Bhuktis. Now, why was this done? All this while, we have learned that the Guptas ruled over a vast portion of the Indian subcontinent. Now, if this was under the control of just one kingdom only, it would have been very difficult for the king and the council of ministers and judicial officer to take care of the entire kingdom. Which is why, for the purpose of better administration, this kingdom was divided into different bhuktis. Now, these bhuktis were laid by a person called Uparika. And this Uparika was also assisted by Kumaraditya. So, here we can see the power that would have been completely concentrated in the hands of the king had this been centralized in nature was divided and diffused among different officers in the Gupta administration. Now, these bhuktis or provinces were further divided and these were divided into districts which were known as the Vishayas. And these Vishayas were then presided or headed by the Vishayapati. So, power or the kingdom at large was being divided into several categories. And last but not the least came the villages as another subdivision or subcategory of the Vishayas. And these villages were headed by the Gramapati. Just the way we have the village Sarpanj in today's world, the Gramapati used to preside over the villages during the Gupta period. So, this administrative system explains how the Gupta administration was decentralized in nature. Now, let me ask you a question before proceeding with this lesson further. The Gupta administration was centralized in nature. Will you be able to say if this statement is true or false? Well, the correct answer is the statement is false because the Gupta administration was not centralized in nature. It was decentralized in nature and we just saw how the kingdom or the power structure was divided into several categories for the purpose of better administration and better implementation of different rules and policies. Now, during this time, there were several other designations apart from the ones that we just discussed. Now, how do we get to know about these various designations, these various offices? We get to know these from the various seals and inscriptions that the archaeologists have discovered which belonged to the Gupta period. Now, when we discovered many of these seals and inscriptions, we found the term Kumaramatya that occurs in six Vaishali seals. Now, the question that arises in this regard is that what does this term Kumaramatya mean? Well, the term Kumaramatya means that a high ranking officer who was associated with an office or Adikarana of his own. So, Kumaramatya was another designation in the Gupta administration and this is the Vaishali seal that tells us about this term known as Kumaramatya. Now, let me tell you something important. The term Amatya records in various Gupta seals and coins and inscriptions. And from this, we can also understand that Kumaramatya was the most frequent or prominent category of Amatya. Now, Kumaramatya 
referred to the people who were associated with the royalty, be that the crown prince or different revenue officers or other people who were very closely linked to the royalty. Now, this is a designation that we get to understand from the seals and inscriptions. But these seals and inscriptions also carry mentions of many other designations which are not decipherable or intelligible by the archaeologists because they have not been able to understand what those designations mean. But the mentions of these designations tell us that various designations existed in the Gupta administration. And the point that we need to establish here is that the Gupta administration had several offices, several different designations and all were done in order to maintain the state in a better and more able way. Now you can also consider this in the light of modern day scenarios. If you consider the Indian parliament as an example, you will see that there are different kinds of ministers who take care of different offices. Likewise, in the Gupta administration as well, there were different people, different officers who were responsible for taking care of different kinds of things. Now, Harishana is a person with whom we have already been introduced. I am sure you still remember that he was the court poet of Samudra Gupta and he was the person who wrote and inscribed the very famous Alabad Prashasti of Samudra Gupta. Now when we see him in terms of the Gupta administration, we get to know that Harishena was one of Samudra Gupta's Navratnas and along with that he was a Kumaramatya a Sandhi Vigrahika and a Mahadanda Nayaka. Now, a Kumaramatya was a high ranking officer who held an office or Adhikarana of his own. This is a point that we have already discussed. Now, what does this term Sandhi Vigrahika mean? This means a minister of war and peace. And along with that, a Mahadandanayaka was the chief judicial officer or the chief justice. Now, as a very important person in Samudra Gupta's court, as one of his Navratnas, Harishena held these positions of Kumaramatya, Sandhivigraika, and Mahadandanayaka. Now, when we talk about these various designations, another very important point that we need to keep in our mind is that most of these offices were hereditary in nature. What does this mean? This means that when a person held any or many of these posts, it invariably meant that his son would also hold these posts, which means that it was hereditary in nature. Likewise, Harishena's father, Drubhavati, was Mahadandanayaka. So, by birth, Harishena also became a Mahadandanayaka or a chief judicial officer in the Gupta administration. All this while we have been talking about how great and huge the Gupta Empire was. In fact, the Chinese monk Fa Hien mentioned that the Gupta administration was very benevolent in nature. Crimes were very less in number, which is why the punishments were also not very strict and harsh. But we also learned about the decentralized nature of the Gupta administration. So, the Gupta ruler had to pay all these officers. Now, how were these officers paid? Do you think they were paid the way your parents are done by the companies or the business firms they work with? Most definitely not. Because during the Gupta period, monetary transactions did not take place like they take place in today's modern world. So, instead of monetary transactions, the Gupta rulers now paid these officers in terms of lands. 
so land grants were extended to these offices by the gupta rulers now in order to manage such a huge empire and also to pay these officers the gupta rulers also required resources and wealth how did the gupta rulers procure these resources for this reason they relied upon land revenue so land revenue formed the major source of income of the gupta empire but all great thing that rises to the pinnacle that rises to glory comes to an end and the gupta empire was no exception because all this while we have been talking about how various gupta rulers kept on annexing more and more territories and kept on increasing their empire we also need to take into account that after this period of glory after this period of flourish the gupta empire began to disintegrate by the end of the 5th century and the disintegration of this gupta empire also meant the dwindling of the importance of the cities like pataliputra and magadha because pataliputra and magadha were important trading centers during the gupta period and when the gupta empire started falling into pieces these cities also began losing their importance now we have also talked about the geographical extent of the gupta empire at great length and it is there that we got to learn that the gupta empire controlled a very huge and great part of the indian subcontinent they almost covered the entire indian subcontinent apart from few areas which they did not control now when such a great empire was falling and crumbling into pieces invariably came into being a political vacuum because there was chaos there was anarchy because there was no one ruler or no one kingdom which would restore the gupta empire or which would now hold and gain control over this large territory so what followed the disintegration of the gupta empire was a period of political vacuum instability uncertainty chaos anarchy in a subsequent lesson we will now try to trace what happened after the gupta empire completely fell into pieces as in what happened which were the powers that gained control over different regions in the indian subcontinent this is the line of discussion that we will be pursuing in our subsequent lesson don't forget to subscribe to our channel and hit the bell icon you can also register for free at deltastep.com or download the delta step app to learn one to one with our amazing teachers or to get access to all our 5000 plus amazing videos as per your school syllabus master each topic with our adaptive practice technology get million plus questions with step by step solutions and unlimited mock tests get all your doubts resolved instantly learn via games and win amazing prizes like playstations and ipads so at delta step learning is not just fun and easy it's rewarding too so register for free now